Hi, my name is Rodney Perkins, and I live in Warren, Mass. Warren's a small town, it's a town that, that I love. I lived here most of my life. So, Mr. Perkins, when and where were you born? I was born in Winston, Winston Mass, 1925. So how December. old? In December it was, the 6th. So how old are you right now? I'm, I'm, I'm uh, nine, 94 and 6 months. Do you feel like you're 94 and a half? Sometimes I do. <laughs> Physically, what is it like to be 94? Well, I'm in fairly good health, so, you know, I'm fortunate like that. Uh, I think growing old isn't a bad thing, you know. I appreciate it, getting my, this age. And we get a little smarter, I think so. I think I am sometimes. <laughs> and tell me, Mr. Perkins, for the record, what branch of the service were you in? I was in the Army. I was in the uh, infantry. The 80, 87th Division. Uh, then uh, when I went over, I was in General Patton's Third Army in the Battle of the Bulge. Yes. And, and could you just state for the record uh, what regiment and company you were in? I was in the 345th, uh, 87th Division, the 345th, Company B. And what was your specific job in Company B? When I first went overseas, I was a private. I was a first scout in the infantry, in a rifle company. And as, as people, I don't know if they know a lot, but uh, if you, it, like in the Battle of Bows, you if you live the day without being a casualty, you are lucky. You, you just stood for the day. Uh, after uh, a few days in the Battle of Bulge, our company lost a good part of it. We lost all our officers, and we lost, in my platoon, we lost all our squad leaders, citizen squad leaders. Like I say, we had no officers left. So, I... They needed a squad leader. I just turned 19, so I was a squad. We made one squad out of our, out of our platoon. There's three squads in a platoon, and we made one after one day in the, in, in Morsi, a little town in Belgium. And so then I, like I say, that's when I became squad leader. And there was one, we, like I said, we just made one squad out of our platoon who was supposed to be three. And that's one or two days. So before we get into your combat experiences, uh, we're going to do a little bit of your early life. Um, for the record, though, what was the highest rank you achieved by the time you left the service? Uh, a staff sergeant. Now... Uh, Let's backtrack a little bit, sir. You were born uh, in Massachusetts. Did you uh, grow up there? Yeah, in Winchington, Mass. Talk to me about growing up in Winchington. I was born in Winchington, Mass, but I don't remember. I was just a little baby. What I do remember is living in Lemister. I lived there all my young life, and I, I went to school in Lemister. We were very, very poor. Uh, there was uh, 10 kids in our family. Because at that time, in Depression time, everybody was poor. There was very little money, you know. So I, I always, uh, 
My father worked on the WPA, you know. But we, we never starved or anything like that, but life was hard. You know, people today, especially the children, have no idea just how difficult life was in the Depression years. Can you tell some stories about... Okay. During the Depression, life was, was hard. The food... Uh, my father used to be out looking for a job. He didn't have a job. I give him... I remember my father uh, coming home f from looking for work. And it's the only time I ever see him break down because there wasn't, wasn't food. He come home, there's no food in the house or a seat, and he just lost it and he broke down. I remember my mother saying uh, a cup of milk and a piece of bread fit for a king. Because <laughs> milk, milk was hard to come by. We didn't get milk till President Roosevelt. Can I mention him? Of course. Best president maybe in the United States. I think in my time I know he was. I know he was for the people, you know. And when when he came along, he taught, you know, not, 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 nobody should go without eating. And I remember that we didn't have milk. Milk was uh, too expensive for us. But when he came along, he made sure we all, our family, we all got milk. I remember going to a little farm in town and picking up two quarts of milk. It was the first milk we had for a while. A lot of kids at that time, they, they called crickets because you, had, you didn't have enough calcium. You know, you didn't drink enough of milk. Or and a lot of them had crooked legs, you know. And, uh, and like I say, to me, President Roosevelt was, was the greatest president in my time, and probably all time, in my opinion. He was for the people. He was born a rich man, and that even makes him greater because he thought of the, of the people, all people. He thought of, of all people, not like today. So uh, you mentioned that you were one of ten children. Ten. Where were you in the order? Well, I, I had, let's see, one, two, I've got to figure this out. <laughs> I had, I had two, uh, three sisters older than me, so I was the third one down, the oldest boy. Yes. Talk to me about the responsibilities of the oldest boy in a family of ten during the Great Depression. I had a lot of responsibility. We used to have... Uh, surplus food and stuff back in those days. They had like a commissary like, and then uh, I can remember walking three miles home uh, because I was the oldest boy with two bags of groceries. I remember one day the bag broke and I had to hide the food behind the bushes and go back and pick it up. I used, when I was 14, I used to make homemade bread. I used to get flour from the commissary, and we used to make our own bread. And uh, every, uh, every uh, say, Monday, I made the bread over the weekend, and every Monday, we would have fried dough from that bread, you know. But, uh, so there was a lot. I know my sister and I, my father worked on the WPA, and after he got working, done working, say, in the afternoon, he would leave his job. He worked out in the country, probably about five miles from the house, and uh, 
he would uh, cut laurel and hemlock to make wreaths for like Christmas time because we always had a good Christmas because my father would pick laurel and my mother and him, they would make wreaths, Christmas wreaths. And my sister and I had to sell them. We sell them. We had door to door. You go door to door and sell them. I know you got a 10 cents, I think, for them. I, uh, I never liked the job because I'm not a good salesman. You know? <laughs> I hated that. But my sister, Hazel, and I, we, we, that was our job, going around the house to house. Yeah. And so we ended up always had a good Christmas. Yeah. I, I was the hurricane time. We had a hurricane in 1939, I guess, it was. and a big tree fell down. Because heat, heat was one thing that we didn't have much of. It had al almost no heat at times, you know. If you go upstairs into your bedroom uh, with a glass of water, it would freeze. They would be frozen by morning, you know. Three of us slept in a bed, so the one in the middle kept nice and warm, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, what else? Uh, what else would you like to hear about? Would you like to, uh, how poor we were? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I got that part already. We were poor. Um, but we all were the same. We were all in the same boat. It's not like today, you know, separation, we were all the same. And so we didn't even know what poor was because we all were poor. Can you talk to me about your school years? Can you talk to me about your school years? Oh, school years. They, I went to school on, uh, what the heck's the name, in Bennett Street School when I was younger. Then I, we moved, and we got electricity that year. We didn't have electricity. We used to have lamps. They had running water, but not. A, we had a bathtub, and, a, and every we took a shot a bath every week. My mother would put a sheet around the stove, and that's what the boys, the girls went first, and then the boy. We had a big tub of water. I think the water was getting dirty by the time it got to us, but <laughs> yeah. And and every week we took a shower, so I mean a bath. Not like today, you can go every day, but yeah. And what would I like to say? You were talking about your school years. Oh yes, that's right. I was talking about my school years. I lived at Bennett Street, and then I got moved when I was a little kid to Hall uh, Priest Street School. And that, back then they used to have bullying like they have today. Well, when I moved to the new school, there was Italian kids ran the school pretty much. And uh, I was getting picked on. I uh, I remember going home, not sleeping. I remember thinking, what am I going to do? So I thought what I was going to do. I was going to get the toughest kid, and I was going to fight with him. And we fought all over the school ground the next day. We ended up in the coal bin in the school, and the bell rang. Then they had one janitor for the whole school, and it was coal. It ran the boiler by coal. Him and I were still fighting in the coal bin. I can remember these two big hands coming and picking him up and me. Two, it was a janitor. He picked us up, brought us up to the principal. If our <coughs> parents, we had to sit on the steps on, facing each other that day. We became the best of friends. Him and I have always been friends. <laughs> I uh, I remember so much different than we all played with knives, the jack knives. We all had a knife. 
And when you get in trouble with somebody, you could go out and have a fight with them. And not like today, if you fight, you get discipline, no matter if you're right. But I was always a believer to, to, to fight for your right. Whatever it was, you fight for your rights. And that's how it was back in those days. You know. And we used to play, we used to play a lot of games, you know. But we didn't have organized sports. Nowadays, kids don't know how to play, but they have to have a grown-up tell them how to play. I got kids in the neighborhood here, born in the neighborhood. I never see them. They were there in the computer or something. They are out playing. Like I think all kids should be out playing. But that you know, we go home from school. We all got out. We always had games to play. You didn't have to have somebody to tell us how to play. You know, we know how to play. Kids know how to. I don't think. Half the kids today, they don't know how to go out and play. They don't. I read an article in the paper. It was telling them, well, I don't know the bad times we have now, but it did, telling them how to play. No, you didn't have to tell us how to play. You know. What high school did you go to, sir? I didn't go to high school. I got out of school when I was 16, as quick as I could, and I got a job. What was the reason you quit school? I was I wasn't very smart, you know, in school work, and uh, I was I needed money. I, you know, we needed money, so I got a job in a, a chicken plant, dressing chickens off. That was my first job. It was two cents a chicken, I think it was. Yeah. What would you do with the money you were making? Uh, I gave most of it to my folks. I uh, I can remember when I was 14 years old, when the year of the hurricane, 39. A big, couple of big trees fell out, and my father said to me, he was going to have somebody cut it up, but it would cost him five bucks. So I said, I'll do it. So I did it for five dollars, cut all the wood for the house. I was fourteen. Uh, you had to cut with a buck saw, not a chainsaw like we have today. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, we worked hard. You know. Before the war broke out, what were you planning on doing with your life? I planned I was going to be a farmer, a, a chicken farmer. That's what I had planned, yes. I bought my first house when I was, uh, I was uh, 17 years old. My folks lived in the house that I bought. I had, had my father had to, have to sign, sign for me. I, I wasn't 18 yet. I was 17. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, 17 when I bought my first house. How did you afford that house? Huh? How did you afford the house? I worked in that Dressing plant, dressing chickens. You know, they take the pin feathers off and all the feathers. And I worked that year there. How much did the house cost? I think it was seven thousand. Maybe yes, yeah, seven thousand, I believe. Yes. And then when I became uh, eighteen, because I went in the service, I got out at at, at twenty. And then I bought the farm up here where I live. Yes. Um, how did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? I was, I believe I was in a theater. And it was my, it, my birthday was December the 6th, so that's December the 7th, I believe. So I, I remember. Yeah, it was a sad day, you know, for all of us. Can you talk? about the reaction you remember seeing in your community after Pearl Harbor? Our community, together, togetherness. We, uh, I don't know if we're ever going to see it again. I think America, we was all more organized, more appreciated of our country than we are like today. 
school kids, when you were in elementary school, you could buy a war bond. You had a book that if you had a dime, that's all you spent. You buy a stamp. Eighteen, when you got eighteen dollars and seventy-five cents, you could buy a war bond. The kids after school, maybe uh, on a holiday, they would pick up metal. Just young kids with a wagon, they go around the neighborhood picking up metal for the war effort. Every everybody was on the same page. Was united. Uh, I like never before and probably never again. I doubt it anyway. The way things are, and uh, everybody was proud. Uh, like when I was I got drafted at eighteen, which I was uh, proud. We all were. Nobody protested that uh, I know. We was all glad to serve our country. Uh, because we knew it was the right thing. We're doing right. The country wasn't divided. Every, everybody knew. Every family uh, either had somebody in the family in the war, in the war time, or I had some friend. That, so we all, all, all knew. So the whole front, everybody pitched in. You know, that's when women went to work. Women didn't work. My my mother never worked because she had a hard job uh, with ten of us anyway. But but uh, every everybody that's when women went to work. It might have not been a good thing. I don't know because back then mothers. Mothers were ahead of the family. You know, you have a man to bring home the bacon and the mother took care of the family. You got more from your mother than you you know, than from your father. She she brought brought you up. And to me, because my opinion, I wish it could go back that way, but it would never will, you know. But you gotta have two people in the family seem like to work today. And you know, like the wage scale, some of us work for ten bucks an hour, another guy works for fifty bucks an hour. <laughs> so could you please tell me, Mr. Perkins, I really appreciate you sharing all of this with me. Um, take me through your journey of entering could you please take me through your journey of how you got into the service and what happened to All you? All right. I was, uh, when I turned 18, you had to register for the draft. And I, I registered in March, and I, no, I, I really wanted to have December the 6th. I, I registered by March. I was in the service, and uh, I went for basic training, Cantwell, Georgia. That that place isn't there anymore. The foot is gone, and it was a, uh, a nice town, but it, it was just you know, blacks lived in one section. I remember going to town. And I remember this old lady standing there at the station with two bags. And the bus driver stopped and let her in the bus. Mm. And I thought, how awful for living up north. We weren't that way then. And so she was saying, she said to the bus driver, you know, I've been waiting here two, two hours. He slammed the door. Because the blacks had to sit in the back of the bus, and and at that time there was still room for, it. and I felt like getting up to say something to the bus driver, but I didn't. Yeah, it, very very separated, you know. 
the, because the blacks then get, did not get used very good, as we all know. <laughs> Do you, are there any other memories you have of segregation in Georgia, uh, of, of the soldiers? Or? No, we, we didn't have a, a black man in the infantry. Our company, there was black soldiers. I guess they thought they weren't uh, disciplined enough. That's what I understand. Uh, but I know in other wars after, black soldiers were, you know, were just as equal as a white man. That's as I look. I have some Vietnam veterans, uh, veterans and they'll tell me the same thing. That, you know, black men were good, good soldiers, yes. And, uh, <coughs> uh, oh yeah, after my basic training, I, uh, that was in Macon, Georgia, by the way, that's where that town was. And, uh, oh yeah, I got a watermelon yesterday. It makes me think, watermelon down there, uh, they had watermelon garden, the people did it. I, I, I just thinking of that. that you know, for 10 cents or, or something like that, you get a big piece of watermelon. People have it out on their lawns. Well, anyway, at the base of training, I went into the uh, 87th Infantry. So where did you join the 87th Division, and what happens to you from there? Fort Jackson. I, the 87th Division had all the officers, all the cavalry, they had the, all the squad leaders, but overseas they needed troops. So they, they had took everybody out and over for replacements. Then, then we came in, they had to make the squads back up again with all our listening. So I was picked. We were in our maneuvers and training, and I was picked for it to be first scout. Brosco, this a young a young boy, this Italian beautiful boy. He uh, he was my he was the second scout. And, and so, take me through what happens to you from there. Okay, from there, I don't know if you heard, you heard about the Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary. Well, there, there's a whole history story. If you like history, that's a whole history story right there. Anyway, we went over with Queen Elizabeth. There was uh, over 15,000 on that ship. Not, if you went to the Pacific, you were on Liberty ships. It took you a couple of weeks at least to get over it. It took us maybe six or seven days to, to go, because we had to go zigzags because the German had the U-boats. And we landed, our, our ship, Queen Elizabeth, landed in Scotland. I went up deck in the morning. It was in a nice, in a, it was all fog. You couldn't see a thing. So I went down for breakfast. It came up, and the sun came out, broke the fire. It was so beautiful. It was a beautiful harbor we were in. And to this day, I don't remember how we embarked, how we got off that ship. I don't know, it was a ramp. I we went over the side. Everybody I talked to don't remember. And so we, ended, we went to Scotland anyway. And the Red Cross people there giving us coffee and donuts on the train. <coughs> and then we ended up in Bitter Off, England, and the little England town. And it was in a big old warehouse. It looked like a big, big old warehouse. And the first thing they do, they had, handed us a body bag. You know what a body bag is. And, and then there was a big pile of uh, straw, and they told us to fill it up. That would be our bed, that, that bale of straw. So at that time, 
we thought that was kind of rough, but really, it was it was like luxury. It it, it it's combat went on like the Battle of Bulge anyway, and so I uh, keep going. Yeah, you're doing great. Okay, we in uh, from uh, England. We ended up La Havre, France, because our, our combat was in Metz, France. Our first combat was in Metz, France, the forts. In Metz, there were some big forts out there. And uh, I can remember the forts. We took that fort, and uh, I, I think I slept in that fort one night. It wasn't a very nice place to be. It was so cold and damp, you know. And in Metz, the Germans at night, this is December now, and the first part of December, and the gardens, they still had gardens that you could still pick some vegetables out of it that was still fresh. The Germans would come out the far at night to steal food. But, you know, they didn't have that much to eat, I suppose. And they come out of the forts down off of these big hills, and nighttime they come down and pick up steel food. So, at Metz, we get. Some of the French people didn't like American soldiers, you know, even during the war. Certain parts of the country didn't, wasn't care about. They had their own reasons, I guess. And we get, used to get fired on by the French people back then. The civilians. Civilians, yeah, correct. And uh, so in the side was our first battle, you know, the side basin that near Metz, and, and we went into Germany. We fought in, in Germany, and I can remember we leaving uh, it, I, I'm not sure what division it was, if it was the fifth or not. We're leaving them from combat because they've been to hell. And uh, this is the way, the way I remember. We're leaving those guys taking their foxholes. And when I, and when we passed each other, the, the other ones, it was in the woods, in the side base, and they're getting out of the that uh, uh, foxholes and were taking their foxholes over. I can remember these guys, I said, not a word was said, we passed each other's. And uh, these guys, I said, am I gonna look like them out of combat? Well, some of them, uh, you know, they came out of combat. They were, they were eye, you look at the eyes, you could tell what they've been through. And, and they, of course, weren't shaven or anything. And I thought, oh my God, am I going to be looking like that? Uh, I imagine we did after a while, you know. And then from there, the Battle of Bulge broke out. We were inside of Germany, 13 miles. And then the, and then the uh, Battle of Bulge, because we didn't know Battle of Bulge. We thought it was just moving to another front. It was going to be called Battle of Bulge. It's going to bring us to Christmas. We, some trucks came, we, we were forced out, out of the forest and got into these trucks. Some trucks had, were covered with canvas, some weren't. The ones I was on didn't have no cover. It was mighty cold. It was just before Christmas. Moved back, I think it was Nancy, Germany, back into France, and, and then we got on trucks and, and were into, uh, Belgium. Anyway, this Christmas Day, 
the truck we were riding in, in the convoy got uh, broke down. So the convoy left us there. It was a ver in a back road uh, in, 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 a, in the forest someplace. But after a while, we got, they got our truck started. And we were riding all night on an open truck, almost freezing to death. Because uh, our officer sat in the cab where it was nice and warm. Coming to this little village after we got our truck started, like I said, it was at night. Coming into this little village, I, I'm not sure if it was in France or, or if it was in Belgium. Well, anyway, the truck wasn't going to stop. Some of the young guys in the truck thought they were going to fr freeze to death in the truck. This was mighty cold weather. One of the kids got up, <coughs> like I said, the, the, it wasn't covered, so he got up on the on the cab of the truck. He was going to break the windshield in with his feet because we were go, going very, very so he did because I believe was had, the officer was thought we were behind enemy lines. We didn't know where we were, so he did stop. It's a little small uh, town, like a little village. And in the, uh, got out of the truck, went into a barn, there was cows there, and we laid against the cows to warm our body up because we were freezing, you know. And I don't think the cows gave much milk the next day, you know. And, uh, so we won on it. Then we got back on the truck. Now it's Christmas, Christmas Day, I believe. Our company, Company B, you know, the 87th and 345th, and they had brought up some turkey. They on the front lines, they our cooks cooked the turkey. We're still moving every day. We'll move it to the ballot. We haven't got there yet. And so, like I said, we got lost. And I think it was Christmas night or early the next day. It was late, anyway. We found out. That's when we found our company. Company Sheldon was our company commander, a nice man. He made the courts get out of the foxhole. Our company had our foxholes all dug. He made, made uh, the courts get up and warmed us up some uh, turkey. But we were so tired, we didn't make a foxhole. Yeah, us guys, we, we took our blanket. We carry a small pack. We carry a blanket with us. So. We put the blanket around us. I think that was Christmas or, or the day after. I'm not sure now because it's so late. You know, it may it could have been in the morning. And we laid up against a tree. That so for Christmas we laid up against a tree till daylight came, and then we moved out. And we came to this town. It was going to be what they call now the Battle of the Bulge. I, uh, what we did there, before we went to Morsi, Mor Belgium, that's the name of the town. This is where we had our, our company had our worst battle of the war. It was in this town anyway. So he, <coughs> Before we went into town, you know, we had those big overcoats on. We just got them, put them in a big pile. And they told, now we only got our field jackets on. It's cold. So we put them in a big pile, and they said, you're going to be getting them back, which we never seen again. Now, this is for winter time. 
I remember going to Morrissey the first day. Anyway, I was the first scout, and they sent me and the second scout into town before our, before our company uh, taken the town over to see if there's any enemy, see if there's any Germans in that town. The second scout and I went in, and the town was quiet. This is in Morrissey, Belgium. And, uh, so we had to come back. We came back with a report. You know, there was a little book we said that runs through the town. Now we weren't going to stay in the town. We was a rifle company, and we slept outside most of the time, all, most of the winter. Now we don't have overcoat. We have field jackets only, and our shoes were leather. They weren't waterproof or anything. So we came back and, and we gave the report that it, we seen old German. The town's very quiet. And uh, we don't even see the people. I, I don't know. And so they did, did, there was a bridge to cross this bridge. We were going to go through the town and dig in. So I told them my cap captain, Sheldon, I, that it was, I didn't think it was a good idea to go across. It was a little wooden bridge because it was, if the Germans there, they get that zero in. So we decided to walk across the brook. And it wasn't deep, a little brook, maybe a foot deep because we got our feet wet. This is, uh, this is, uh, December. It wasn't Christmas. It was right after Christmas anyway. There was no snow then. We had pictures of Mar a Marcy with snow, which wasn't us, because there was no snow until the first of the year. Anyway, they send the scouts out. Myself, I go first, cross the board. We didn't go the, oh, the bridge. And then the second scout, and the rest of the company is behind us. And uh, so I'm walking through this field, all of a sudden go brrrp, a machine gun shooting at me. So I, uh, I signal to the second scout, that I'm being shot at and to make a skirmish line, there's a machine gun. We're going to uh, take that machine gun, you know. I could just about see the second scout. I couldn't see our company. He was even further behind. So I got up. I start walking to this house where the machine gun is. Brrrp. Again. I hit the ground. And then I feel a burning feeling. I know I'm shot. But the machine gun was in the house. It was very close, a few, wasn't too many yards, maybe 50 yards from me. And I know they could see any, if I moved. So I, when I hit the ground, I felt a burning feeling. So. I know they could see me in the house, so I start moving my hand just a little bit at a time to feel where, where I was shot. And uh, as I'm putting my hand back very little, they see me, they see me move again. This, now this is the third time, and, and they really blasted the heck out of me. Dirt flying up all over, trace of bullets. They had every third bullet the Germans had in the machine gun was a tracer bullet. You could see it coming in, in at you. And uh, I stopped moving. I didn't move at all. I had my hand for a long time, and I don't know, maybe a couple hours, I would think. Uh, I'm wondering what's happening. I said, now, 
they're going to come out of the house because they was near, they're going to check me out. But I have my, they think I'm, they think I'm dead, which I, of course, should be three times with a machine gun blasting at you at, at short range. So, because I, I'm not a religious man, but I, I had a God and an angel. So, I'm waiting for them to come out, check me out. They think I'm dead. But I got my M1 and everything's going through my mind. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, I'm laying there maybe a couple hours, nothing's happening. They don't come out of the house. Pretty soon, the machine gun starts up again. Now, this time, they aren't firing at me. They're firing over. We lost all our officers. We had no officers. That's what the delay was taking that machine gun because we didn't have any officers and we didn't have any, like, no squad leaders, no assistant squad. They was all, sh everybody got sh wounded. So Fouché, he's from uh, Texas, a platoon leader, took over the company and they made the attack on the uh, machine gun. They got up where I was, and then we were into the house, and, and we took the German prisoners. The walking wounded, the walking wounded, uh, took the prisoners back with them. Now, there was, I would say, there was seven or eight of us that most of the guys didn't make it up that far, you know. <laughs> anyway, that machine gun did a job on the guys, you know. So we were walking back, so we decided to walk back into town. Now, we come to where I said that machine gun was, there was a machine gun set up. It had that bridge zero in. It was hot, but the Germans had left it. It, it was uh, steaming hot, red hot, and they had left it. So we go out back into town. We go in, there was seven or eight of us, I'd say, going to this little house. Uh, no, not a little, a farmhouse. There was a family there, the family lived in, was living there. There was an older couple and a young lady that had two kids, two young kids. The older lady was very scared, American soldiers going into her house, of course she was. But uh, this, uh, this young guy, American soldier, put his arm around the older lady and he said, don't worry, ma madam, American soldiers, he could speak a little French. He, don't worry, American soldiers are here now. Everything's going to be fine. As he's talking to her, a bullet comes through the window and hits him in the nose. And the old lady passes right out, goes right out. Now, after a while, everything calmed down. And we were in, like I say, I think there were seven of us in that house. They calmed down and they, uh, they fed us. We had a slice of bread, uh, with, you know, a slice of bread with jelly on it and a cup of warm milk. He just melted the cows in the van. Now, nighttime comes. The Germans moved back into town with their tanks. And uh, then our company moves, moves, our company moved out of town, moved back. And the Germans took it over again. This is, you know. So that night, 
we don't we don't know this. We don't know how the company moved out. There was Company C on one end of the town and Company B, and so we're still in that house that night where the Germans moved back in, and uh, we could see houses getting on fire. It uh, a lot of it was American artillery shell in the house. The civilians still lived there. So I said, well, the house next to us was, the, was burning. So this is all brick, but the houses do burn because the interior all wood, the, the, the roof is all wood. So I went upstairs into the attic. Sure enough, the roof's on fire. So what we do, we make a, uh, like a bucket brigade, and the water was in the cellar. And I was in the attic, and the old man's on the ladder and handed me water, so I'm trying to put the fire out. But the smoke got so intense, I had to get down, I couldn't breathe no more. And the old man, he don't want to quit pouring water on it. So I had to get down to get some air, and somebody else went up to the air, tried to put the fire out. Well, no, they, we couldn't put the fire out. So now he has to let his car, see the, the barn's connected, connected right to the house. You open the barn door, you go right, right into the, the house, the kitchen door, you go right in the barn. He has to let his cows out. And when he does, his cows got mowed down. And uh, anyway, we had to leave that family. They was on their own. And uh, we had to go to a different house. So the next morning, our company moved back into town and the Germans moved back out. And because we lost a lot of people. And uh, Can you tell me about your memories of the actual fighting? Yeah. Well, as I was saying, I was the first scout. And then that machine gun got a lot of... There was another machine gun down at the, at the uh, bridge, that little wooden bridge, and there were snipers. And, and it, they had us like in a field. And our captain, Captain Shelton, he, uh, he got shot in the head, a bullet to the head. He, he went through. He lived, he lived so. I talked to his wife one time 40 years after, and they, she said, well, he was in and out of hospitals for five years. And when I see him, he had two sons, and they, they brought him to a reunion. It was the only time I ever seen him. And we had Enough men at the Morsi, Belgium, a day or two fighting. We had enough of men. There's three squads in a, in a platoon. We had enough of men to make one squad. And that's why I became squad leader. That's how I got to be squad leader. I had just turned 19 years old a few days ago before that. And we made one squad out of our, our platoon. It was supposed to be three. After that, we move out into the outskirts, you know, to dig in and protect the town. Uh, I, now I'm not sure how many days it was because we keep moving every day. Yeah, but it was right around Moore, Sea Belgium, where we we came 
to, or there was already American soldiers who were there. But these soldiers, now, now the snow had came. These soldiers were frozen. They were all dead. Oh, excuse me. You know, you think you are. You think you got everything under control, but you know. <laughs> well, anyway, somebody there was someone who stripped of the clothes. Had no clothes, and the reason that I found out after the. The Germans would just uh, go into town, the dress with American, they could speak American language, you know. They uh, would like, uh, the roads, road sides they would change, the road sides make you go off the wrong direction and stuff like that. So the Germans would kill the Americans and take their clothes? Yes, I, that's what I believe happened. All, all the clothes, they had no clothes. Uh, the, everything, uh, everything was gone, which I believe they could talk perfect English to them, know about the ball teams, everything, and, and they, you wouldn't know it, you know. How many Americans did you come across dead like that? I can't tell you how many, but I can tell you there was a few of them didn't have clothes. Maybe two or four, I don't remember. I could have pictures of them laying there and with no clothes. And at the time, because at the time you wonder, wonder why, you know, it's strange, no clothes was it, you know. But then I found out after that's, that's why they would take, because they get caught with American uniform, American, so they took all the clothes and they could speak like they perfect English. They could tell you about the ball games and everything else, you know. So that that's why I figured that they were, didn't have clothes. The other one, some of them were in the Fox Souls, we had this, the American soldiers in Fox Souls and out of Fox Souls. So when we got there, we got fired at. So we jumped into these Fox Souls, and, and uh, some of them had uh, American soldiers still, and we had to throw them out. And we got in, dead soldiers out. And, and uh, I remember. Uh, was, uh, we had a squad leader from, a, not a squad leader, a patrol leader. Uh, he was a ball player. Yeah, he was a big guy. I can remember, but he hesitated jumping in the foxhole because there was a, a foxhole he was getting in was a dead soldier, an American soldier. He hesitated, he got shot, and he got killed. Uh, what was the fire that you all were taking on at that time? The, the fire was taking, it's mostly small arm fire, you know. In foxholes, the Germans were just in front of us in the area, and they were dug in there. And then when we got there, they, they started shooting at us, you know. So we, had, we jumped in the foxholes that was already there. They were made, and some of them had dead soldiers in them. And some of them, uh, American soldiers, yeah, they were American. I don't know if they were from the 87th or where they were from. I don't know. Now, I never did find out where they were all from. Yeah, the fox hole that I jumped in, it also had a dead soldier. I jumped in there with, a, with somebody else, and we had to throw them out. And we took the whole hole over, yes. You know, 
You see so many of them. It, uh, you get numb to it, you know. The first soldiers I'd seen bothered me a lot, you know. But uh, that bothered me, but you get numb, you know. You, I don't know how to say it, but it, it's what you uh, used to seeing, you know, dead soldiers like that, but not stripped of the clothes. That bothered me, yes. Back in the South Bay, we were like uh, 13, 14 miles inside of Germany, you know. So I, I remember one day, we had it. Every day you keep moving, every day you dig a foxhole. You might dig two or three foxholes in a day, you never got one made until they tell you you got to move out. So, so this was at night. I dug my, uh, we dug a foxhole, named my the, the first, second scout. And cause I, I lived in the, and up to them with my friend, the second scout. And we dug our foxholes together. The next morning we get up, they give you your ration, the sun comes up, you get out of your foxhole, and you gotta move out. And you get a C ration, I think they would say. They're this small ration like that. That was for the day. And I got out of my foxhole that morning. I could not find my rifle. Now, I don't know if it was covered with dirt. Somebody took it. But I couldn't, and I had to go out as a first scout. Because the first scouts go out first, then second scout, then your squad would follow them. I had to go that day without my weapon. But the next day, or maybe the same day, I found a rifle, a dead soldier. There was a plenty of American dead soldiers around, so, and I found a rifle he just didn't need it anymore. And I, I never let that rifle out of sight again. You feel so naked out there. You had to be out front, and you and you don't have a weapon because that's your job, you know. Um, that and that was my one of my first experiences seeing dead soldiers. You know, it's one thing to see the enemy dead, but to see your, your own, own side, yeah. people who, who are just like you. At first, those things really, really mentally. Uh, it, it was hard for you, I have to say, and uh, to take it. But it, uh, after a while, I could say, you've seen it all the time. We see it all the time. And because we was in a rifle company. You know what a rifle company is, probably. The rifle company is an infantry. And the, the infantry got Seven, uh, fourteen percent, like that, or or infantry soldiers, and they casualty was seventy-five percent of the casualties came from the infantry, and the rifle company even more. Mm -hmm. and that's where they get most of the casualties. When the uh, litter barrels, the one that pick up the dead. And the wounded came to our uh, foxhole uh, in uh, foxholes, and uh, if you dig back then, some places you could only dig a little, little, little ways because it was frozen. Uh, there'd be water, you know, there'd be water, and then the foxhole, some of them is only a foot or two deep, and they were freezing over. When the little bears come at night to pick up the dead, uh, the wounded, they, uh, one of them, they came to one foxhole to pull the, he was still alive, but unconscious, to pull this man out of his foxhole. He, uh, 
they, they couldn't pull them out. They, it was nighttime, but he was frozen. His feet, the water froze and froze his feet into the fox. So, so they had to trip the ice out to get him out. Um, so, just going forward, sir, after that incident with uh, the naked Americans, the dead Americans, after that incident, you guys got under fire and you're now in a foxhole that was occupied by an American, American soldier. Uh, I, I was an American soldier in that, in that foxhole, and, but I don't, I don't know what, uh, if they were 87th or who they were. I don't know. So, so at, at that point, what happens to, to you in, in your story? Um, you, you guys are now in the foxhole taking on fire. Right. I'm going to tell you, I don't know. Gone blank. I, I, I say the next day, I don't remember. I don't remember nothing. It went blank. Yeah. So what's your next memory then? Then my next memory. We moved to um, Luxembourg, the little country of Luxembourg. Our division moved off of that front into Luxembourg. And uh, most of the people, it was like a no, uh, I forgot the name of that city, a small city. It wasn't uh, it wasn't the city of Luxembourg, but it was another small city in there, and uh, it was like a no man's land. So, uh, my squad, we were in a, on an outpost in Luxembourg, and and probably about no, there wasn't any high buildings in that city, and we. The rest of the company was back. I think they were, I don't know if they were in buildings or they were in Fossil, but we were outposts in, in that city. At nighttime, we could see even uh, German patrols go by our hotel. We were saying it was a hotel. Across the street, I can remember, it was a jewelry store because we were told not to go touch anything, no, no looting. So I, I never took anything out, but. So at nighttime, we had a telephone strike to our hotel. We had done that. It might have been four stories high, the highest building in the area anyway. So and downstairs, I can remember there was a bar and they still had some wine. So we had our share of wine. So, we slept upstairs, and we could see the American soldiers go by. Uh, uh, they were on patrol, on patrol, you know. And uh, then there were the Germans. You could also see them go by. They knew where we were. They would cut the line to our outpost. We had a line strung to our outpost, but they used to cut it. So we used to put. I used to put one guy on guard. I was a squad leader by now. And uh, in front of the door, uh, just in case we got some German company. And we, like I'd say, we drank a lot of wine there. <laughs> and, and then I, uh, we wouldn't go out in the daytime, only at night. And that store had jewelry in it. And we were told not to touch it. We never touched it. They said it could be a German would put mines on it. If you touch it, it would blow up. I, I, that was to keep us, I think, from looting, you know, not looting. Well, at, at nighttime, a uh, forward observer from the artillery would come to our outpost, and we would go down by the, the river. The river separated that city. And the Germans were trying to build a bridge across it. 
So we go down with the follow observers in, in a house next to where they're trying to build and call artillery fire in. So I don't think they ever got that bridge filled. Built, I mean. One night, a Tiger Patrol, that's American Patrol, they stopped at our house. They was going to go get a get some get a German prisoner. Well, they had to cross the brook to make it, but they didn't know the brook was so high they got, had to go through deep water. On the way back, they stopped at our outpost. They had a, one German prisoner with us, and they was wet and cold. So, that was the my experience there wasn't much fighting going on or anything. It was a no man's zone, so. And from there, Koblenz, the city of Koblenz, Germany, that 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 was the uh, biggest city. We, that's the capital of the Rhineland. Beautiful country there. So the Germans blew up all the bridges, beautiful bridges. It, it was a waste of time. We still crossed them anyway with little paddle. First of us would go across with a, with paddle boats. Then then as, as we took the ground. The the navy the navy was there even it, with the assault boats they took the rest of the people across in the assault boats. We uh, we took at uh, the city of Koblenz we took the airport out three forty fifth part of the eighty seven we didn't take the town we took the airport. I can remember going in one hangar with this young, oh, what was his name? I forgot his name right this minute. Went to some building, I guess it was a hangar, and there was a German soldier laying there. And uh, he was an officer. He could speak English. So he was shot. His legs were pretty well mag mangled up. He. He spoke English, and he's, we set him up. He wanted water, so we gave him some water. He tells about his family to us. He hasn't seen them for two years. Mm -hmm. And anyway, he told us already part of his life. And he wasn't a German, he told us. He said he was an Austrian. I said, well, what's the difference? Uh, he's not telling us. So they get dark bread and the German gets the white bread, and, you know. <laughs> he takes his wallet out. He shows us his family. He hasn't seen for for two years. He's got to have two kids. He had a wife. And because... So then we have to leave. I tell them, well, the medics will be coming along. They'll take care of you. And I don't know if they, when they ever got to him. And I don't know if he even made I know his leg was in bad shape, already gangrene turning in. So that was the, that was the, the airport in, in, in uh, Koblenz. What happened to the German? I don't, that's something I don't know. I told them the medics would be along shortly, probably, and they would pick you up. But I don't know how long. I, I really don't know. So I just want to go back a little bit, sir. Um, I'm reading over some notes that Andy mm -hmm. sent me. Yeah, it was inside of Germany, and I was sending up an out, outpost. It uh, with two replacement kids never been in combat before. So I go out there to set up this foxhole. That, that that was an outpost, and and the Germans was right in uh, 
find them in the wooded area. Then they could hear us, and they were shooting all over the place, like wasting the bullets. They, they, they couldn't see you or anything, but it was at night time. So I'm trying to get this hole set up for them, but again, no place. The, the, the ground was frozen. So we took, so I said to one of the kids, they, they, like I say, they never were in combat before. I said, now you stand guard and I'm gonna see if I can get something dug here. Because the ground was hard and frozen, so. So I hear him say, <coughs> halt, this kid, this long guy says, halt. And he says, uh, oh, I thought you, I thought you was a kraut, that's German. I thought you was a kraut. And I looks up, and it, it was a German soldier. He was a, a scout, I guess. He had white on. I says, he is, shoot, shoot, shoot. So he put eight rounds into that German. And he fell in front of the, our foxhole. And he didn't die right away. He remember mem mem something in Germany, in German. And so I said, the old boy, the next morning you don't have a foxhole. We don't have a foxhole even to get in. And there's going to be somebody coming after us. The sun coming up, and I'm looking off to my flank. And I, uh, I see the squad leader, and he's pointing towards us, his, his soldiers, he, a machine gun he's setting up and pointing towards us. Now we don't even have a foxhole, maybe about a foot deep, maybe. So we, we had a telephone strung out to us. And so I called in, and, I, and I, whoever was on the other line, I said, well, you better hold your fire because we're coming in. We don't need, not even a foxhole here, and we had killed a German. He'd be beside our foxhole, and in a few minutes, we're going to be dead because I'm sure they, aren't let us, they won't take us captive because we just killed the guy. So one on the other end says, oh, no, you can't leave the outpost. I said, hey, we can't. I said, we're coming in. So, so the other two kids, like I said, never in combat before. He says, the guy on the other end from the company headquarters says, let, let me talk to somebody else. So I handed the phone to the kid. And he said to me, Sarge, we can't leave our outpost. I said to him, you follow me. Because, see that German soldier? We're just as dead as he is for no reason. So I said, now what you do, you follow me. Whatever I do, you do. Now. When we get to a foxhole, one of our company, you get into that foxhole no matter whose hole it is because the Germans are follow, going to be following us. So the snow was deep. It must have been a foot or so or more deep. So there, sure enough, they, they came, the, the, the infantry ever was coming after us. So we, I said, now we're taking off. And I called on the line. I said, we're coming in to hold your fire until we get into a foxhole. So they did. Now, the, like, I, we, the Germans are chasing us, shooting at us. So we roll in the snow and get up and run some more. And we run. And I, in any foxhole you find, you get into it. Don't matter if it's yours or somebody else's. When I got there, a lot of the weapons were small, like rifles and stuff were frozen, they weren't working. But they had the mortars. The mortars were all set up in the back. And, and, and two of the Germans were so surprised I could see him standing there dumbfounded with the mortars start coming in at him. 
my rifle was clogged with ice. I was trained that if it was uh, your, your bore was a clog that they could blow up, you know. I jumped in the foxhole and it was full of ice stuck. And I stuck down and I pulled the trigger, blew it right out. Yeah, so that so the next morning the Germans retreated back after they started getting fired at. The next morning, somebody uh, brought the two kids, the two working kids, into the headquarters company and gave them combat infantry. Bad. The only thing that was said to me was, oh, you had a bad time last night? I'd say, oh, we had a little trouble, and that was the end of it. <laughs> I thought maybe I was going to hear more. Because I told them where to go, you know. I said, we aren't going to stay here. We're coming in because it's suicide. It's stupid, you know, it's fighting for nothing just to, you know, yeah. How close was that German when... You shot him? Mm -hmm. That kid shot him. I told him to shoot him. Maybe uh, a few, couple feet away. Did, did the German have his weapon raised? Or what well, the German had a burp gun. See, Americans didn't have them. They're like a, a, a automatic rifle light. They're a shot bullet, shot gun. Anyway, he was pulling it off his shoulder. He had it part way down, and it was going to blow do us in, you know. And when I looked up, he was taken off his shoulder, and the kid was thought he was American. And that's when I said, shoot, shoot, shoot. He shot eight rounds into that German, and the German falls back, and he moans something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how long did that German last before he died? Uh, not, not too long, maybe a few minutes. He's still living, and he's mumbling in German. Yeah, I didn't know what he was saying. How come you guys just didn't put another round in him? No, he put he put enough in him. That was for sure. <laughs> yeah. That kid must have been so scared. The kid, yeah, and like so, the, I gave the when I gave the poem to the kid, you know, oh, the colonel said we can't leave our outpost. And the colonel said that. I said you just listen to me and follow me. <laughs> Can so you, we lived to fight another day. Can you tell me about some of the times you remember firing at the Germans yourself? Well, I can remember the Siegfried line. They had a uh, demolition squad. I, that's what I was in. There was three of us. I had dynamite. Yes, is it. I had a block of it. It was on me. And the Two other kids follow me, and we got, it's in the safety, uh, the bunkers, the bunkers are thick walls, you couldn't blow them up, uh, our fire would just, uh, but they weren't very good to be into. They had to have, some of them had to have air, you know, so they had a vent on the top. So, this bunker, we had to take it, so I, <clears throat> I, I was on a demolition squad at then, so there was just three of us, and the rest of the company, the rest of the companies to draw their attention in the water, everything would fire at this bunker. It was probably three, four feet thick. I don't know. They could never do blow it up, but it, it was. If you were inside, it wasn't a very nice place. A lot of, so I got on top of the bunker, and I'm waiting for the other two guys. One had the, the blasted cap. One had a primer card. Now I'm on top of the bunker. They don't show up. They chickened out, I guess. So the next day, uh, maybe, you know, I got off of the bunker and I was able to get back without getting shot at. I got shot at but not killed. I took the blasted cat and the primer cut, uh, card and I carried it all myself. 
I never had a daughter again, only that one time. So, I, what so, do you mean? Huh? Did you end up having to throw it in there? I was had to throw it in, but these other two kids was part of my team. They were supposed to be following me, mm-hmm. but they chickened out. I was on top of the bunker. I'm waiting for it. And I was going to put it into a vent. They have a vent because they have to get air. And they, they, they took off. They, I don't know what happened to them. They, so I was kind of all worked up after that. And I took everything away from them, the primer cloth and the plastic cap. And I kept it myself. So next time I go, I won't depend on you guys. But you didn't have to go. <laughs> didn't have to do it again. How were you able to get to the bunker without they being detected? Ma- they made a lot of fire. Everybody would open up, and it, we had bazookas, and it even had a flamethrower, everything to draw their attention. And and that way, I was able to get up there. Yeah. You know, I didn't believe it. You see a German coming out to surrender, you know, with, with a little white sheet or wag or something. Someone would take pop shots at him, but not my shot. The first thing I would tell him, you never take a shot when a guy wants to surrender, you know. I said, I'll tell you, if you do, the next day they won't surrender and, and it'd be you that they're going to get. So, that, but I remember a good person. He just got a telegram. His uh, his brother got killed, and uh, he took this German. He said, "I want the first German that surrenders." He took him out back, and he shot him. Now. Forty years after we had a reunion, well, we had a reunion with Alam, but this was about 40 years, and that's the first thing he came out with. He said, he said, you know, you know, that actually murder, what it is, you know. But he, he revenge, that was him, revenge for his brother they had killed. He got killed in combat, and he got a telegram, his brother was a, so, he took this German out back and he shot him. Do you hear about this or you saw this? I saw, I didn't see him shoot. I see him take him out back and I knew what happened. Yes. But I didn't actually shoot him. No, I didn't see it. I can tell you another story that's not very nice. Uh, he was a... Uh, platoon leader, which him and I, we never got along in combat. He's somebody I didn't like. He, I don't know, it won't sound good. He took two German officers one day, and uh, he sent them up against the wall. And when he did, he shot them right up, both of them right up the rear. Yeah, that's murder, you know. When I got back to the States, I think it was back to the States, I was calling the headquarters company, and I was asked about any murder that you know, went on, because even American soldiers weren't supposed to murder anybody, you know. We, we were different than Nazis. Uh, and that's why they loved us. They loved us over there because American soldier, a Nazi was so much different than American soldier. You know, he he could put his arm around a uh, Belgium or something. You know, like they did do, and uh, yeah, you know, try to comfort comfort them. So with that platoon sergeant lined those two German officers up and he shot them through the butt. Right. And it killed them. Oh, oh yeah. Well, yeah, they were gone right away. But I never, I never reported anything that went on like that. But he wasn't a friend of mine. No. <laughs> what was the reason he was so angry at the Germans? Had they just killed someone from the outfit? I don't know. Some people. War, war brings out 
bad in you, you know, and why he did it. He didn't have to do it. So I don't know. The Germans also didn't have to oh, the Germans, begin the war, you know? Yeah, well, the Germans did some bad things, you know. So they, they, they did a lot more. Yeah. But, they uh, did. Yeah, well, American soldier and a Nazi soldier are two different people. Uh, if you take over in the Ardennes, they love America's soldier. They still do. Winter time, you know. I'm gonna tell you about. We we weren't. We weren't really dressed up. We didn't have equipment really to to stay out winter, you know, outside most of the time, in the snow or whatever. There's a lot of stories about, I had two pair of socks. I put one under my jacket to, to dry out and one, and I had another pair that I wore because there was a lot of trench foot goes by, you know, you uh, frozen feet uh, and hands. And uh, I would say, most combat, most riflemen that stayed out all that winter had frozen feet. Everybody had frostbite, I would say, almost. Anyway, because you you were bound to. I know, like us, we didn't have overshoes. We just had plain leather boots, and your feet was freeze, uh, get frostbite. Uh, they're wet all the time. You, you, you took and... Uh, we weren't supposed to have fires either. And one time in defense position, we made a fire, a small fire. You could put your feet in the in the fire, you would never feel it. The shoe would be burning, but your feet would be numb. And uh, how did you make the fire without getting detected? Well. We kept the fire down low. See, we could, you couldn't have fire because, you know, the enemy would, put, would, see, would see it, you know. So we couldn't have fires. And I had our ration cotton came in a little box like that. And in my foxhole, I would light that. I, I saved the box, and I would light it and warm your hands up anyway with it. For those who have not experienced being outside in the extreme cold, you know, and when you're living outside as well, I mean, can you describe what the conditions yeah. really were? I remember one time we got a, uh, this kid was telling the story of one of our reunions. He was a replacement. He, he thought, I, I don't know how come he was in a fox or by himself, and, and he wakes up in the morning and he looks out and he sees nobody. He sees no, but no fox all the time, but it had snowed all night. Then after, he, he got panicky because he thought they left him. He said that then after a while, he starts seeing holes popping out of the snow. They, they, they had a big snowstorm at night, and and, and all the uh, in the morning you just see these holes, these uh, helmet heads popping out of the foxholes. Oh, I can tell you, our clothes. There's the same clothes from fall till spring. We never change. They, you know, and if we was you in combat like that, you, you get sick, you know, you are sick and you're tired and you're sick. And we had the same clothes on, never took a shower. It, it shower didn't come till maybe sometime late in the, uh, the end of the war, yeah. One time we did get a shower, some of us. Within the defenses, defense, they had, Three 
two squads up front and one in the back in case the Germans break through. They were having another. So it was in Germany. It was in the winter time. Nice, I can remember a nice day. Water running down the gutters. Anybody who wanted to go to town to take a shower, one one out of a foxhole. Oh, I want to go. I go. So I went downtown. They had a, it was a warehouse, a big warehouse. They had the trucks set up with showers in them. Three three minute shower. You stood in a long line. I don't know, it must have been about hundred feet long, I guess, bare, bare, in a bare ass, you know, you take all your clothes off, you throw them in a pile. We want to get clean ones. Well, they give you clean underwear, but not the outerwear. They're the same. You got to the shower, and you got clean, you got a three minute shower, the bell would ring, and then the bell would ring just before it's gonna go off. It would ring. And uh, one guy that was telling me the story, he was from a, a 347th, the same one that John was in. Tell, he was telling me the story. When he got there, there was no more clean on the coast to have. Now there's this big pile of dirty clothes that you threw out there, they told them all, you have to pick something out of there. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me, you know, what is it like to not take showers? To, what, well, is like, uh, what is it like not to take showers for months on end and to be wearing the same clothes and to be living outside? I mean, you get so dirty. I mean, what does that do to you mentally? It, it mentally, it, it you're so cold, you don't care if you're dirty or not. I mean, you're, you're so cold. You know, I can remember being cold. And one night, we were going to outflank a town. It was in Germany or Belgium, I'm not sure. It was in the nighttime. They said, you've got to outflank this town, but some, by morning, we'll walk at night, and by morning, this other company was coming in from the front of the, or on the flank or something. Well, we're walking through the wood uh, in a line, you know, your squad one after the other. It was a nice night, cold as hell, the moon shining, and <clears throat> and you could, you get a, mar a mirage, like, like in the desert, people see stuff. Well, I'm looking, I said, oh boy, I'm so cold. You see a town down in the valley. I'm thinking, this is what I'm thinking to myself. We'll take that town and we can get in and get warm. We'll go in the house and get warm. After we get down there, there's no, no, no buildings there. There's no town down there. It's all in your head. And, <laughs> Oh, and on the way, I remember that night with a single file line, one behind the other with deep snow. And I, uh, the one I was following went off the trail. The rest of the guys are going this, and he, wake, he fell asleep when he's walking, you know, because you, sometimes you go days and hardly any sleep, you know. You could, anyway, you're following, and the guy wakes up. There were no footprints in front of him. There were no footprints between. He knows he died. <laughs> he went out of the trail. Now we had to turn around and run back and to get into it. Yeah, that's. Uh, Can you talk to me about any experiences you had against German tanks? We very. Uh, we. Uh, you no, know, you see in movies with the tanks, you know, but we, we're not a tank company, but we did have tanks. And uh, the most experience I had with tanks is, is riding on them in the Autobahn when we get to Koblenz. But I, 
we never use them too much in combat. But you know, those are American tanks. What do you remember about the German tanks? Uh, I remember the you know the Tiger Pat. Uh, that's a big tank, but they were so big in the Ardennes that they used to use them for artillery pieces. You, you hear the story, everything about 88, uh, 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 that big tiger, but most of the time they aren't even there, uh, in my experience. They'll put them in the center of a town because they were too big for the Ardennes, and they will use them for artillery. And tell me, sir, um, did you have any experiences against the German planes? Were you ever strafed by the Germans? We, yes, and uh, uh, they called a uh, bed check Charlie. I guess they call him. At time when, if you was in your foxhole, and if your company would have had some warm uh, food for you, like uh, a ration, they warm up for you. Uh, they know in the evening when when to come, when it's uh, child time. That way they strafe you when it's child time. Bed check Charlie, they used to call him. And uh, cause we didn't get strafed, so, but, you know, because the German Air Corps, it, it uh, wasn't large like it was when it started up, you know, but. Every once in a while we would, and we might get strafed by an American plane by mistake. The artillery gets strafed by everything, by our own art artillery, our own tankers, our, our own self. We, how many people we lost that way? A lot, you know. Today they call it friendly fire. One person gets killed in war for a friendly fire, they broadcast it. That was every day over there doing the war all the time. Yeah. Do you have any specific stories that you can share about taking fire from your own side? I, I, uh, what I remember from my own side, you say. Yeah, from the American friendly no, I, fire. What was I going to say? Oh, yes, I do. I forgot. We got fire in Morrissey, the 87th Infantry Division fired on that town. That's the town where I, when you start up and I tell you the story about going in the house. They, those are the houses that got burnt, you know, uh, uh, incendiary bombs and they, yeah. Um, can you tell me, did, when you were in combat, did you have any experiences against German mines? Or mines? Yes, German mines. Some of them were fake, some of them were real. Trip wires. I can remember one time, see, Officers, uh, officers in the infantry uh, don't last long. We we had three company commanders, and one of them twice he got wounded. I had a, a couple of great leaders too, two good men, and Captain Pike. But anyway, now what was the question now? Can you tell me some of the stories you remember about yeah. German mines? Yes. I remember one area where this was, we had a second lieutenant for a company commander, and he used, we see the trip wires all over the place. And he was standing back of a tank that time, and he was saying to us, go and get them, go and get them, boys, go and get them, you know, like, <laughs> like heroes, you know. I said, you go get them. There's trip wires all over the place. Maybe they weren't real. I don't know, but they didn't want to take that chance. <laughs> did you ever see them go off? No, no, I never did. I don't remember seeing them ever blow up. No. Not just that time, but in general, you don't. General, remember? no, no. Um, 
when you were in combat, were there times that you provided first aid to any of the wounded men around you? Divided what? When you were in combat, yeah. were there times that you provided first aid to any of the wounded men around you? I didn't provide. I picked up a couple of them, but did I first say no? Never did. Tell me the stories about picking them up, unless it's the one about Whitaker. We'll get to that later. But were there other men who you picked up besides Whitaker? No, Whitaker uh, is the only man I picked up in combat. Okay, and so when you were in combat, now I'm asking you about your whole time, not just a specific uh, sections, but... When you were in combat, do you remember going on any patrols? Yeah, yes, I do. Uh, I can remember, remember Hitler used to blow all his bridges up, beautiful bridges, which, like I say, they didn't mount too much with cross anyway. One time, I was called into the office. Before we crossed the Moselle and the Rhine rivers, they come together, Moselle goes into the Rhine. And even to this day, I'm not sure what, if it's a Moselle or the Rhine. It was one or the other, it don't make much difference. I think it's a Moselle now, I used to think it was the Rhine. I was called in the office with a couple other guys, maybe about two or three of us, and there was some I believe he was an engineer. He wasn't from our company. We were going to save a bridge before they blow it up because we were back of the, of the Moselle, back of the Rhine. So he told us what we're going to do and how to defuse it you know, before it would blow up. And on the way, if we meet any resistance, we just go around them. So on the way, we met some, but we went around. Then we get to the bridge, near the bridge, maybe half a mile from it. You can see it's still standing, and they haven't blown it up yet. So this officer told us, what we do now, we'll stick close to the building so they won't see us. The enemy won't notice you. And then, then we had to go after there was an opening just before the bridge. Now we got to run for the bridge to get there before they blow it. And just and then we were running to the right at the embutment we were just going under just before we, and it went, boom, blew it up. So that's as close as I, we came to save. We never saved any of those bridges, not that I know of. Did you see the Germans on the other side? Uh, no, no. I uh, talking about the other side. The thing for the Rhine River. I was picked, me and two other, maybe there were three or four of us, before we crossed the river, to go down to observe what any troop movement or anything on the river. Fouché was a patrol uh, uh, company leader, the same guy from Texas. And we get down to the, the river, and we're into this uh, uh, motel, not motel, uh, what do you call them? The, uh, like a, uh, like a, Oh, what the heck do you call them? <laughs> uh, anyway, this building, and it was an old man, an old lady, uh, uh, Chateau, there you go. Takes a while, but it comes. A Chateau. And there's an old man, an old lady, still there. The people ain't living there. So it was a beautiful day, and we watching the river. We see no patrol on the river. It was quiet, real quiet. It was beautiful. And uh, then we got thirsty. Uh, we said to the, the old man and old lady who was staying there taking care of the chateau, we said, we like a drink. 
Huh? They said, we don't have any. So I said, we said, well, we got money. We'll pay you for it. You, you go down cellar, you're going to find some, you know. Sure enough, they came back. Sure enough, they came back uh, with a bottle of whiskey, American whiskey. We drank the whole bottle. There's probably four, four of us. Drank that whole bottle, watching the, the Rhine River, and the only thing that was going, going on was uh, shelling. You could hear the shells going overhead. Outside of that, it was all quiet. Fouché looks at the watch. Oh, my God. He said, you guys are caught up. We were all feeling good because we had quite a few drinks. But we came back down to the main road, and there's a three-wheel truck there, one wheel in the front, two in the back. Well, so we got it going, started right up. But I knew what was going to happen. As soon as it started up, we got just a little ways, and all the mortar shells start coming in, you know. And we just left that vehicle there, and we ran out. Fouché, he never heard anything about us. <laughs> he never, you know, but from being what we condition we were in. And we, we you go hunting, you talk about hunting. I never went hunting. But in Germany, uh, one time we was out looking for Germans, and instead we'd seen some deer. So we went hunting for a deer. We brought the deer back, and, and the cook cooked it up the next day, and we ate them the next day. That's the only time I went deer hunting. This little town, I don't know the name. It only has a few houses in it. We were to t the, the daytime, it went to take it, this town. But the shelling was so heavy that we retreated back into our area in the woods. Then they told us we had to take this town. But the town is being outflanked or, sur uh, or surrounded. You have to take it. Uh, I can remember talking to some kid that day, and he told me, he said, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. I can't do it again. And I never knew what happened. I never seen him again. And so we took it. At night, we went in the attack, and the Germans had flares. It made it look like daytime. This whole field with mortar shells. By the time we got into the town, they had the mortars almost straight up, almost straight, coming right down in front of them, blowing. As we were coming in, they're blowing us up. Well, quite a few guys got wounded, and uh, that's where I picked up. Well, I didn't. The Germans put up Whitaker. Now, they had when we attacked the town. Most of the Germans moved out, but we did get a few prisoners. A few, and like I say, the the martyrs have straightened right up as we're coming in. They kept moving the martyrs more. That there was loads of them, and they kept shelling us as we were coming into town. And. Then I, we didn't know how many, but we knew a lot of guys got wounded. So on this, they got to the side of the road in the gutter. I took these two prisons we had, and we figured, well, can save one guy anyway, maybe. There was quite a few laying there, some wounded, some were dying. Whitaker was in the best shape to save. I thought he could make it. He was he was wounded twice, but that by a sniper now. This is a sniper shooting at him. So then I had I had the two Germans, they was inside of the road, down in the gutter like, and a sniper shooting at us. 
and the same sniper, I believe, that uh, Whitaker got shot. Whitaker was shot twice. So I had the, the, the Germans put Whitaker on a stretcher, uh, and, and uh, he was a pretty big boy, Whitaker. Now they don't want to get up because the snipers start shooting at us again. And if we move, get out of that ditch, they were afraid they were going to get shot. So they didn't want to get up. The Germans did, they didn't want to get up. I told them to get up and we were going to you know, take the uh, Whitaker out of there. Pretty soon they start talking to themselves and all of a sudden they hops up Grab the, the 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 stretcher, Whitaker on it, and ran. And I could hardly keep up with them. They they were, they were stronger than I was anyway, you know. And so they finally got them up out of <coughs> out of the firing range from the sniper. Well, the Germans they didn't want to get up, you know, because they were afraid of the the sniper. The, the sniper was shooting, they didn't know if they were German or American or not, but the, whoever the sniper was, he, he was a good shot. He got, he got quite a few of them. They didn't want to get up. So I just pointed my rifle to the head. Uh, I don't think I would have used it anyway, but they don't know that, right? So I put it to the head to get up, and they said something. And Wang, they picked them up and they ran off with them. Yep. Where did they go? Out, out of the range. Out of the, out of the, back in the, the, the field that we came to to take the town, they came back to there. And uh, we left them off, I can remember, under a tree. And there was an American uh, officer up there. And he says to me, boy, they need you back there. I said, yeah, I'm going back. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any other experiences with snipers during your time in the war? Oh, yeah, well, at Morsi, if you go back to Morsi, there was a lot of snipers. Our officers, our officers, uh, all our officers, you know, got picked off, and they were by snipers because why they got picked off, they were wearing long co coats, you know, like overcoats, and they were wearing longer coats, and so Captain Shelton and another officer, they both got picked off by snipers. And the whole field, when we made the attack on Morsi to take Morsi, uh, there was a lot of snipers, a lot of snipers going on. They had a, <clears throat> they had a machine gun in front, another one at the bridge on the side, and then snipers. Can snipers you, was picking people off like crazy. Yeah. You, could you say on the record when you were shot, where were you shot? I was shot in the butt, cause you know I was laying down. And that was the second time the machine gun opened up on me. How serious was I mean, did it go it, 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 it was a flesh wound, probably went in an inch or two on me, you know. And uh, enough, I got a purple heart. And, and can you tell me, uh, you mentioned earlier a story about a sergeant. My uh, sergeant took over. We we had and that's why I was laying there for so long, waiting for the attack on that machine gun, because the snipers got our officers. We had no officers. That's right, and we didn't have any squad leaders, no squad leaders. So that's when I became squad leader. I uh, I just turned nineteen a few days before that. Did you pick up any souvenirs when you were in combat? Yes. I got some I, I could show you, but... When we're done with this part, we'll yeah. do that. But tell, I, me, I, on, tell I, me on camera, what kind of souvenirs would you and the other men go after? 
I got a Baldwin 32 caliber pistol. Right. I got, uh, you know, some uh, like uh, a watch. I got a swastika with all all the names of of my platoon. Uh, it's written right on it, about that big. So how would you get these souvenirs in the first place? You get them from going into a building. Uh, off of, a, off of a, a prisoner of war, somebody you just took for prisoner, right. yeah, like the rifle, like the piece uh, at Belgium, 32 caliber, that's off of a German officer. This guy, I don't say his name, he, he, he used to steal the rings. No, he, used to, he, he, he was a sergeant. Used to still offer the dead, the America, all the Germans. Sometimes you could get them off from swelling. You know, he would cut the fingers off with a bayonet. Yeah. What do you mean swelling? Well, after you die, or oh, whatever, whatever, they he can't get the ring off. Is this the same sergeant that uh, yeah. shot them in the butt? Yeah, same guy. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Do you He's, remember his name? Yeah, I ain't gonna say it. <laughs> you don't want him to face a war crime trial? Yeah. It's over one. I, 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 I know. Did he ever go to the reunions? Oh, I'll tell you a story about him. I was a sergeant. I was a squad leader. So he got a rank over me, right? So him and I, the Germans were going at night, If you two, two guys in a foxhole. If you fall to sleep, they could throw a grenade in your foxhole, you know? So we had turns. One of us had turned to go around our, in the, our platoon, keeping one guy awoke all the time. Well, he didn't want to do it. He said, no. That's your job. So now it's my job. It's supposed to be his too. The next morning, uh, we get up. We get up in the morning. We move out. They give us a ration and we move out. So he he was still sleeping. So some kid come running. Out, oh, Sergeant Epper, he's sleeping. I said, Don't you wake him up. He needs his rest. And, And he needs his rest. And so he fought, he, he, now we're moving out. Said the scouts out there and we're moving out without him. He wakes up. I don't know how he woke up. Somebody woke him up on his own. And he, I could see him running out. And he's pissed off. He's mad. And we never became good friends after that. <laughs> Is that your son? Did yeah. Come in? Yeah. You okay. can tell. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot of bullets. I uh, I never ran out because I had my cartridge belt uh, with M1s. I had two mandoliers, one on this side and one on that side, and I had a grenade here and I had a grenade there. I, I always carry plenty of ammo, and I uh, some people would run out because they'd be shooting all the time over nothing, you know. But I I, I say I I'm an, uh, a saver, you know, just like I am still a, a saver, you know. I I don't waste. I don't like the waste. Doing the battle about day after day, you just go and go. You wake up in the morning. And they hand you a ration, and that was for the day. And you would, you, the scouts go out first, and then you do. You start shooting where you think they are, the Germans. And how do you tell where the Germans are? They, they probably were firing at us, and we're just firing back. They're probably in a wooded area or something, you know. 
most of the firefights that you would get into, what would you say would the distance be between you and the enemy? Me being a scout at the time, I was very close. The rest of the company, half of the time, they don't even know where it's coming from. You know, they don't know where the artillery coming from. Uh, a soldier like in a rifle company, he can be surrounded, you know, like in Marcy, we were. When we went to the field and they had uh, machine guns and they had uh, snipers all around and they kept picking you off. And you, you, like I said, you usually don't see them, but they, I mean, they're there. Oh, yeah. Well, I think the enemy in Morsi, we captured them after we, we took them, the, their machine guns, and, and that's the day when there was quite a few wounded Americans. We take the one the American soldiers that are walking wounded, that that shot, but they're still able to walk. They would take the prisoners back, and we would get close to those people. How come you didn't go that particular incident in Moise? Why didn't you go back with the walking wounded? You were wounded. I was wounded, but I I I, I could walk fine. You know, I had a slight wound. I had a, maybe an inch or two in my body, but didn't hit no bones. Mm -hmm. And I never reported it for a couple of days after. And then a, a, a frontline medic. Sometimes in my squad we have a medic that come with us for, for he probably for the whole squad, you know, uh, for the whole platoon, rather. And, uh, he, after a while, I went to him. He sold me up, patched me up, and I just kept going. Yeah. I could have went back. I didn't go back because uh, I know there wasn't too many. They needed everybody. They could could fight a fire a gun, you know. Do you remember? Any action you guys got into at Metz? You talked about being in Metz. What yes. do you remember about the enemy fire? Yeah, mostly artillery. And uh, not that I can remember getting shot at by civilians over there. They didn't, you know, like I said, they they weren't fond of Americans. Or Did you guys yeah. fire back at the civilians? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> But they'd be hiding, you wouldn't see them, you know, they just, yeah. And uh, they claimed we weren't there, according to the French government. Some of them were. Some of them got that uh, French medal of honor. I never got it. They said you weren't there. Well, but yeah, I, I don't know why. I mean, I know people that got shot around there, or, and, and, you know, I was there. Anyway, some of us didn't get it, though. But it don't matter to me if I did or not. But if they got it, it would be nice, you know, but no big deal. Well, the city called Blinds, uh, 345th, didn't take the city itself. It, it, it took the airport out, right outside of there. There was a, where the Cold Blinds and Rhineland come together. There's a fort there. German has an old fort. And it had a beautiful statue of a general, I don't know what his name is, but he's sitting on a horse. He's huge, a huge statue, probably bigger than this room across. Well, General, General, general Patton, I think he was jealous. He, he wanted us, to, the 87th Infantry, to shoot him off. They did. They shot him down. They went down into the river. When I went back over there in 93, he was back up where he belongs, and he's still there today. What do you remember about the defense, the defense that the Germans put up in Koblenz? 
What kind of yeah. fortifications do they have protecting the city? By, by the time we got to Koblenz, because the Germans were running, it, it, it wasn't too stiff of a, 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 a defense because they were losing, you know, so many men. And I, I uh, remember taking the airport. We rode on the Autobahn on tanks, on top of tanks, and then we come to a roadblock and they shut it off. Now we have to, the infantry has to get off the tank and take the town. And where we were was the airport district. And it was nighttime, it was getting dark. So we get off the tank and then we start getting fired on. I, by German the small arm fire and and we couldn't see it. and there was a area that was like you know goes like this here so you and what it was is it was the uh, air corps you know they had a shooting range what it was and somebody was up there. And I can remember, like one guy was German was there with a uh, machine gun, not a machine gun, a burp gun firing at us. There were some tanks at the other end behind us, some German tanks. And then there was our tanks out on the road, and they were all firing at us. Our American tanks, the German tanks, yeah. So some guys ran up. Uh, try to get the tankers' attention. They got on top of the tanks, banging on them, trying to get their attention. Stop firing! You're firing at us because we advanced, and they they were shooting over there. <laughs> they thought they were shooting at Germans, of course. And then there were German tanks behind us, and we didn't know what tank was what, who was fighting. And that was a night nighttime fighting. That's not fun. What happened to that German with the burp gun? Uh, I, I imagine, I don't know if he lived through it or not. I mean, you know, all firing going on, fire, small arm fire, tank firing, and we were getting shot. So we don't, I don't really know. Oh, I tell you about the, uh, yeah, about that officer already. What? The officer that was in the hangar that got shot, that was at the airport. Oh, is that right? And that was the next day, yeah. Yeah. It was in Germany, and uh, these loudspeakers were set up in, in the woods. I didn't know if they were Germans or if they were American because the voice was in German and America. My opinion was at the time that it was the Germans set it up to surrender or they're coming to pick you. We're going to come out tonight and take you out of your foxholes. Well, I thought, oh boy, I'm waiting for this to happen. General, our, ca our company commander came to me, our captain. He says, we're going tonight, we're going to go in the Germans uh, foxholes and dig the Germans out of the foxhole. I was in him, it was pitch black, and we all we already had a few prisoners that we had dug out of the foxholes, and we put them in one area, and we had a couple of guys guarding them. Now, the uh, a German up in the up in a tree had a burp gun. And <clears throat> and we had a few, and, and he stopped firing at will. All, and when the Americans and the Germans, everybody hit the ground, and the, but the Germans got up and ran away. We lost all the prisoners that we had. But we're still continuing. We go to another foxhole. I was with Captain Pike, him and I was together. We go to this foxhole to dig up two German soldiers, and they're sleeping. Now, how could they be sleeping, I figured. So I put my rifle in. They didn't get out. Captain Pike says to me, throw a grenade in. 
I take my grenade and I just didn't have the gut to do it because they were sleeping. So he took his grenade and he threw it and it went off. So you know what happened? What happened? They're gone though. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't hear him snoring anymore. So the only prisoners that we got out of the whole deal was two medics and one, <clears throat> two medics and, and uh, one American prisoner that was wounded. And they they were in the Germans' foxhole. And these two medics took care of this guy, this American soldier. So he told told the Americans to uh, to pass on the word to be kind to this man, these men, because they took care of me the best they could, best they could, knew how to do in combat, you know. So that's you know that's how it was. Um, what happened to the German who was firing the burp gun up in the tree? Who knows. Gonzo, <laughs> if he, he escaped away out of the area, uh, did we shoot him? I don't know. If we did, we didn't see him. You know, we knew there was somebody in the tree shooting at us. That's all. And um, did you actually throw the grenade in the hole with the Germans without pulling the pin, or you didn't throw it at all? I did pull it. I did throw it in. I did not pull it. How far away were you from the foxhole? Oh, right there, next to it. Right in the foxhole, almost. Almost. When they threw the grenade in, oh, maybe a couple feet. Not very far. Mm -hmm. um, what do you remember about Captain Pike? What kind of officer was he? Captain Pike was a great man, and he was a great leader. When he came to companies, our company, he was from Company C, for March, March, we lost, we didn't have any officers or squad leaders and stuff. He came as a second lieutenant, and he finally got wounded too, but he was out for a short time and he came back. Yeah, he, he was a great man, a great leader, yes. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, When when I was in Marcy, when the house and thing burned and down, and and then the old man in the house had to go to the barn. He had to let his cows out, and when he let his cows out, this was a German tank down the road, and he mowed his cows down, and that, you know, there was a runner. See, we didn't have communication like today, you know, telephones and stuff. We we had what we call a runner. See, the company knew that we were down there in the south, so they sent a runner out to tell us to move out of Morrissey that night. He never made it. He made it to, we found him the next day in front of our house. He had, he was dead. He, he got, I don't know how he died, from a wound or from shelling, I don't know. But he was laying in the road. Yeah. What was, do you remember his name? No, I don't. No, I know, I knew his name way back then because I knew him, but I, I, I don't know it now, no. Could you please tell me your memories of being under German artillery fire? For someone who has no idea what is that like, can you describe it, please? The, the artillery fire, you know, at some, I got to be a veteran of, uh, I could tell when the artillery is coming in and going to hit your area. I mean, when you had rookies, they would be hitting the ground all the time, but but if you were a veteran under fire, some of it you can tell that's not going to hit. It's going over. The ones you don't hear is the one you got to be careful for. They go like a mortar shell will come, bing, you blow right up as soon as it hits. And at nighttime, 
the Germans have sent out what they call screaming memes. They are a barrel. They, they, as soon as they leave the barrel, they start screeching. That's why they call them screeping. And, and that, they are a scaffold thing. At night, they keep you awake because you don't know where they're going to hit. What do they sound like? Huh? What do they sound like? They just screech. It, it's a screeching sound. And, and it will keep you up all week if they're going to hit your area or not. You, as soon as they leave the barrel or the guns, I don't know how many, in, on, maybe on a Jeep or something, I don't know how many barrels, but there's quite a few of them will be going off, and they screech. And it, it was a scary sound. They uh, probably weren't too accurate, but they uh, kept you awoke at night. And the big artillery, of course, you, you don't know. If you could hear them coming, a lot of the time you have a judge that they aren't going to hit you. Oh, another bomb they had. You know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the flying bomb that had wings on it. The V-1. It had, had wings, like rockets. Before they had the rockets, they had the flying bomb. I got a card from a guy that went through that, and uh, I could show you, but... And uh, they used to fly low, and you, you, they putt like putt, putt, putt. They didn't, weren't fast moving or anything. And then when they ran out of gas, they would come down, you know. Not fluid, not gas. I don't know what they use. Can you describe what was the closest that some German mortars or artillery shells got to your position? <laughs> Maybe a few feet. Where was that and what happened? That was in Germany. One, one time we're going through Germany, this old man was standing out in front of his farmhouse. Now, it was single file on back there. We didn't want to get too close together. And he was handing us eggs. And he handed me, I had two eggs I put in my pocket right here. And then the mortar shells come in. Maybe, a, I don't know, 10 feet, 20 feet away from a mortar, and it, they, they just come in, they go, Zip. you don't hear them coming in, and they blow up. And and what I lost, both of my eggs, I had my two eggs, I'd see the guys in front of me cracking the eggs open and eating them raw. And I said, oh, God, if these guys can do it, when I get back, I want to do it. But I had my two eggs in my jacket, and when that mortar came in, I hit the ground and smashed both of them in my jacket. <laughs> yes. What is it like, sir, to have artillery shells going off close to you, man? What do you feel and what do you hear? It, it's, it's loud. I'll tell you what, it's very, very loud. And they're close, the ground will shake. Oh, yes. And, and uh, of course, you you're running for your hawk's, foxhole by then if you have one. Yeah, it's scary. It's very scary because nothing you can do about it, you know. Did you pray when you were overseas? Yeah. I don't know about today, but I can tell you we had a Bible. I still have it. And, uh, because I had, uh, the greatest guy, an angel, he was always with me. Huh? I had plenty of times where I should have been killed. Like, I, you know, like laying in front of a machine gun or a few yards away. You almost can't miss me, you know? But all I got was a slight wound. And the thing I always hated, you know, being the scout, you're alone. And being alone, dying, that, uh, yeah, like in Marcy, I figured I was going to die. And, uh, but I was always taken care of. I, you know, I had many times where I should have had, and I had a good guy in an angel. 
I'm not religious too much, but I know somebody who was with me because how can you miss, you know? You, you may not be religious, but you believe in it. I believe, I believe, God. I believe, yes, I do. What's it like to be 19 years old and to think that you're going to die? You're so scared. You know, now some people might tell you they weren't as scared, but I don't believe it. Everybody's as scared, and you're scared to die. And you just pray to get to that day, you know? You just take it one day at a time. And one day at a time. Yeah, one day, one battle at a time. Yeah. In in Morsi, we go back to Morsi, my uh, squad leader, and we lost lost my squad leader and assistant squad leader. They got wounded. My squad leader really wasn't wounded. I thought he was. He went mentally. He lost it, and they, he was put away. He went back to the hospital. And uh, he was gone. He didn't come back till near the end of the war. Now, I already got in squad, so they just gave him a job at headquarter company. They didn't put him out at the front line soldier after that. I can tell you the worst slaughter I've ever seen. Uh, they were Germans. They were moving out of the Battle of the Belt, and the Air Corps, the clouds cleared, and, and we didn't have much air support during the battle bus because it was cloudy every day and wet. And and the air corps caught this convoy, and the con the Germans at the time used a lot of horses in their convoy, a lot of horses. They got strafed by American planes, and there was uh, dead soldiers all over the place. They had just got. Uh, wounded and shot up, and we were right behind them. I'd say right behind, maybe an hour, two hours, I don't know. But there were dead soldiers, dead horses all over the place. We're walking over them. That's the worst thing i ever seen. They were all German? Germans. They were all Germans, yes. One German was there. I stepped over. He says, uh, Wasser, wa for water, they say wasser, wasser. I stopped, I was gonna give him a drink of water, and <laughs> everybody runs off. I have to go because they're all leaving. They didn't, nobody wanted to stay in that area. At all. So that guy, I could still remember him. All he wanted was a drink of water. He didn't get it. I was just gonna to stop to give him the water, but I came not see him there. He had a crease in his head. Probably a, from a bull or a ricochet, I don't know. His head was split open. How many Germans would you say were there? I can't tell you how many. All I can tell you, a lot. Maybe a hundred or so or more wow. right there. Dead, yes. A lot of soldiers. You, you mentioned earlier, though, that there were times that you saw Americans who were seriously wounded. Oh, a lot, yeah. A lot of them. I, I'd seen a lot more. I, I, the first ones I'd seen was at nighttime when, when we were in Germany and in combat. And I got sent over to a different company. And I walked over, there was a big gutter there, and there was some canvas there. And I walked on top of that. And the, uh, uh, somebody in there had said, Watch where you're walking, those are dead people you're walking on. The canvas cover them. They were American soldiers, and those were the first a uh, bunch of uh, soldiers. I I say, when when it first happens, it really bothers you, and after a while, you see it all the time. Uh, if you're in a rifle company, like it, it battle about, you see that all the time, and but you know, you get numb like to it. It, it, something's expected, it's just numb feeling. It, you don't feel like the first time you've seen them. Do you feel like the war took away your innocence? Oh, yeah, but I'll tell you, 
the war or something. It's something you think about every day, you know. About how the day go by that you don't uh, remember the war. It, uh, it does something you don't. <laughs> it's something you don't know why. You think you have everything under control, and all of a sudden it's back, just like that. It never goes away, you know. It's just something that you gotta. You cope gotta with. cope with. You gotta expect that it's gonna be up. You know, you, and you figure. Uh, you you can it. see all the different things uh, 75 years ago. You can remember them just like yesterday. Yeah. It's something you got to come to terms with. You know, huh? It's something you have to come to understand. Yeah, and yeah. well, it's something that, that's with you all the time. Yeah. Um, the pain that you feel, you know, after going through your combat experiences in the war. At first few years, never talk about it. But you thought of it all the time. Uh, you might uh, wake up at night sleeping about it. And I used to sleep in chairs like this at night. I would get up at night because I can't sleep. And uh, just stay up in the chair all night. And then, you know, Thinking about the war? You're fighting the war. Yeah. Yeah. It don't go away. No, never. Can you tell me uh, about your readjustment to a civilian? Uh, when you came back home to civilian life, how were you able to readjust? Yeah, well, when I got out of the service and, and uh, everybody getting out of the service, you know, and all these parties and everything, and and I took to drinking a lot. And uh, a lot of people, you know, it's all party going thing. And, and every day, all that come back to you. It wasn't good to do because it make it come back, you know. Yeah, it, it, it makes you some hard nights, you know. I, uh, I would just get up, you know, like I say, and get in a chair and sleep, the, stay the rest of the night until daytime, and I go to work. And, you know, it was something that just happened all the time, so, yeah. Did you ever, when you first came home from the war, did you try to talk to people about your experience? No, 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 it didn't. Took, took years before I talked about it, yeah. And uh, did loud noises bother you when you first came back? No. No, I know that some people it did, but no, I didn't go through that. No, no car backfiring ever bother you? No, no, a that lot never fired. Fourth of the it don't bother. Fourth of July works and all that stuff. That don't bother me. No, no. I know of people too. You could walk up behind, you know, and, and drop something, and you know, shell shot. I guess they call it. In my company, a man in my my squad. His name was Leon. Luxembourg. His mother had said, no, I sent a letter to his mother to tell him that he was, about him, he was in my squad and where he, where he got killed. She didn't know for many weeks or many, for months if the man, if he was dead or if he was alive. She tells a story in the letter. You know, about 
tells about her son and about all the other boys coming back, and he doesn't. She don't know. She gets letters. See, she don't know if he's a prisoner of war. She don't know if he get killed. She don't know where he is. Anyway, and this went on for a long time, and she was always hoping. And so I told her that he died in Morrissey, and she was the first one that she heard about it. The only thing she heard was that he was missing. Then she gets a letter that he was wounded, and, and she never got the right facts at all about him. So how did the connection to her first happen? Um, how I, did, how did I got a letter in the company headquarters gave us somebody if we want to write to the mother of somebody you know they get killed and uh, she was from Warren the same same this town uh, Warren Minnesota and uh, she tells the story about her son yeah about all the hard all the waiting never knowing if he's dead or alive so was so so you got this this uh, company headquarters gave me her address and asked anyone to write to her yeah yeah they asked me because he was in my squad so I wrote to her yes and you wrote the letter because you were the squad leader yeah and 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 who was Leo Luxembourg he 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 was a rifleman in Company B yeah. I meant more along the lines of what kind of person was he? What oh, Luxembourg, he was a very quiet guy, quiet. And, uh, but he did, you know, he was the guy that would take orders and do what he's told. And, but he it was quiet. He didn't have a big mouth, you know, he was a quiet man. Yeah. And, and how was he killed? How was Luxembourg? I don't know. I don't know. I just know that he... Fouché told me, a uh, platoon leader, send him uh, the same day of Marcy that I got shot and everything, that he sent him back to head, headquarters company and he never made it. So that's the hard part. She wants to know if you was with him, if somebody was with him. So what do you remember? What did you actually write? Cause it, I I skipped, I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell her that he, I knew he was alone, because Fouché told me that he sent him back, but he never made it. But he died on the battlefield. Yeah, he didn't make it back. How old would you say Luxembourg was? Oh, I think, I think he was older than me. I was maybe at eighteen or nineteen. I was nineteen. Uh, probably around 20 or something like that. That's what I think. Uh, yeah. Did you communicate back home during the war? Yes, we did, but you didn't, uh, it could be a long time. We, had, we used to have ma mail call about going car back. You might not have it for a long time. And, and boy, you was always anxious to get mail from home. You know, some poor guys wouldn't get any or and other ones, you know, we get a lot. I, I always get mail from home. I ordered one time, when we was over in the, the Battle of the Bulge, when it started, how cold it was. So I said, if you had a sheepskin, there used to be made out of sheep back then, a, a vest. I said, I would like that. They sent me one because the war was over by the time I got it. <laughs> I, I, had it I had it for years, I kept that mess. It's gone now. <laughs> but you had, a, you had a big family. You Did you write to everyone? Well, my family wasn't that big then, not when I was uh, 19. My, I mean, my personal, they were younger than me. I had like maybe uh, 10. Eight, twelve, you know, because I was the oldest boy in the family. Oh, so you really only. You yeah, my sisters used to write to me. They were older, yeah. 
talk to me about your first reunion with your family after you come home from the war. Well, I had a reunion with my family when the war ended in your victory in Europe day. That was my first reunion with my family. I was going to go to Japan, and we were on a delaying route. They gave you some time off before you went back to camp, and they get your new equipment, and you were sending. We were going to be the second wave to invade Japan. And uh, of course, Truman did the right thing. He dropped the big one. But I didn't figure, I know how the Japs would fight. I didn't figure I would make it back again, no. And so, so tell me, so you were, you were in transit back home, and tell me about that reunion. Oh, I remember it was, it's a, a so great time, you know, my folks were waiting for me, and they knew I was coming. Yes, I... Uh, you're talking about when the war's over or that time? When the war was over. Well, oh, I just, yeah. I just want to know what it was like to meet your family again. It was a great feeling, that's for sure. Uh, you know, we had a big family because everybody loving you. And, uh, and where were you when uh, Victory Over Europe Day? When, when the oh, I never told you that story, Victory in Europe. That... I was in Czechoslovakia. Oh, wait a minute. I want to go back just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia, in the city of Plow, right, right on the border of Czechoslovakia, I met a Russian soldier. This Russian soldier came up and gave me a big bear hug. He gave me a ruble. I still have it. It's about it's a little smaller than a, a silver dollar. To him, that was a month's pay, alarm, and he gave it to me. So that was a lot for him, you know. He was without his pay. I, could, I always wish I had his address, you know. If we only exchanged his address, you know, because he didn't speak English, but you, you could, you know, let's say. But if he... Uh, had gave me his address and wondered what happened to him if he made it through the rest of the war. A young man, you know, yeah. ragged, ragged looking guys, but we were the same way. So, <laughs> yeah. so you, you were talking about V Day. Huh? You're talking to me about Victory Over Europe Day. Oh, yeah, Vic yeah Victory Over in Europe, yeah. Okay, that was there. It, it, Frank started writing it the more uh, plow in Germany. And we was dug in. Now my squad, we always sang on the war. I always sang. I I got a lousy voice, but I the I'm the guy that wish you he, he could sing, but I used to. And my squad always sang. So doing uh, at, at the end of the war, we could make fires and everything. Sit around the fire. A uh, company commander over there, he had, we took a lot of wines from some warehouse and he passed it all out. Now we were singing around the fire, singing. And we were singing Negro spiritual songs and all that, different things. And, and uh, this officer came by and he says, uh, we're having a, a talent show next week and you're going to be in it. We are going to be in it. I said, oh, no, no, we're just singing for our own enjoyment, and that's all, we, we're not going to go. You are, he puts us down. Now, I'm supposed to go on stage. Somebody come running down and said to me, you're going to be in, uh, in France, you're going to be in Paris for Victory in Europe Day. If you hurry up, because there's a truck leaving for Brussels, Bel Belgium, in a few minutes, you grab what you need because they're leaving. I grabbed what I needed in my clothes and my duffel bag. I, I got on this truck and went to Brussels, Belgium. The next day I went to Paris. 
I got there just before the the uh, victory was signed, before they signed it with the Germans, the unconditional surrender. And uh, it, the streets were loaded, you could move. I got in my hotel, and I got downtown, like I say, just before they signed it. And I, I was with another friend from the 87, and we were sitting on the hood of a bus in Paris, and nothing's moving. There's so many people. The horns are going you know, off celebration. I met, there was two beautiful young girls standing on the sidewalk, all dressed up, hairs all that. So we said, come on, come to get to the crowd. But the crowd, you know, was so thick. They said, they came, we said, come on. So they finally did. They went to the crowd, and we picked them up, put them on the hood of the, the bus. And now it was hot over there. That hood of the bus was hot, and they all, Wah. Anyway, I was with them for four days, three and a half days. Uh, I, I won a nice girl, a really nice girl. But she took me all over Paris. She had to be home by a certain time. Her parents didn't know she was out with an American soldier. They didn't know that. Not until girl. after the fact. Was she your first girlfriend? I had girlfriend. I never had a steady girlfriend. But it, it, when we were kids, you know, and girlfriends like that. Yeah, she was the first one I was serious with. And I was 19. She was probably 18, I guess. I'm guessing. And they, we corresponded for a while. And came Christmas time, I sent her a little gift. And now her mother's going to know that she was out with the American soldiers. She, he, she, never know, she never told her mother, even though she was writing to me all the time. The day I was going back to Germany, you know, uh, from France, she said she was going to be at the railway station when my train leaves. So I'm waiting and waiting. Finally, the train leaves or whatever. I said, well, that's the end of that romance. Yeah. And then I get a letter from her. She had my address in Germany. She sent me a letter. She was there, but uh, she was there late. And uh, the, tra the train was just moving out. So, but we communicated, but it's so far, far apart then. And then I met my wife. And of course, that's the best thing happened. You know, I finally had to tell her that I'm I'm going to be getting married. <laughs> yeah, so a, a nice girl, no 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 tramp, a nice woman, and I always wondered, uh, what's the guy, uh, Duncan, the guy from, he was supposed to see if he could find her, but I guess he never did, <laughs> never find her. Uh, it would have been so great to tell her life after what happened, you know. Do you, do you think you have kid number nine running around in France? <laughs> no, 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 no kid. <laughs> I know that. No kid. No, but it, it would have been if we, you know, France was a long way off then. You had to go by boat, you know, and money, money I didn't have, you know. Um, what life advice do you want to give to future generations? Well, I want them to know this, you know, this is the greatest country on earth, by sure. It's just too bad what's happening here. If, because we have a president that separated America, he's a president that separating the world. This is my film, the, and the world. Now, Come Election Day, I hope they get out and vote so we'll be rid of him. I think he's evil. He's an evil man. He shouldn't be president. He never should have been. I don't know why American people vote for such an evil man. That's my opinion. If he goes, the country can get back again to be great again. Yeah. What, what, what kind of, uh, I, I guess what I really meant was more along the lines of, 
if you could talk to your great 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 grandkids what do you want them to know for their life oh i i i want them to know uh about my bringing up in depression days what do you mean what advice would you want to give your future generation your great 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 grandkids what is, what is just something you want them to know? Oh, I just want them to be good, honest citizens. That's what I want them to be. And can you tell me, Mr. Perkins, what kind of person do you want people to always think of you as? I don't know. I, uh, I hope, oh, yeah. Uh, I hope they think I do the right thing. I try to do the right thing anyway. And I always worked hard that I you know I brought up all these kids and and uh, never went on welfare or anything. We did it on our own, you know. I have no doubt that your kids and your family will always think of you as a great father and a good husband and all that. Well, you can say I loved all my kids. And we were on all trips together at Father Days and Mother's Days and Easter and all that. His family was years ago when I was younger. Some going on every weekend, every weekend they were here. I'm the same age you were when you were in combat, roughly. Is there anything you can tell me for my life? How old are you? Well, I'm 22 now. Yeah, well, you're a young man. When I was 22, I was an old veteran. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's right, you were. Yeah, I, I was 18 and 19, yeah. I just have two more things and we'll be all done, sir. Um, what do you remember about the crossing of the Rhine River? Oh, I remember crossing the Rhine River. Very good. We, we, we paddled. They had a smoke screen. You couldn't see the other side because it smoked so the enemy couldn't see us. Well, anyway, the first of, of us that went across was riflemen. And we went across. I think there was six in a boat. We paddled across, and because the German blew up all the bridges, like I had said, and uh, but after him, after Hitler spoiling his nice bridges and everything, it didn't slow us up. Slow us up very little, but you know, we we were right across there in a few days. In the same day, the engineers were building a, plan, uh, a pod two bridge to get tanks across. The same, as we're crossing the river, they're already working to make it. Yeah. Were you taking on any enemy fire as you crossed? We didn't have a lot. Some companies did. Uh, we, we had some fire. The thing is, when you're crossing that river, you couldn't, didn't have a point to hit, you know, because we're separated because the smoke, and there is a current, and you don't feel it on the Rhine. It's a big river, and the current is very slow. And some of us are probably a mile apart by the time we got across. And <clears throat> and by the, after we were across, a very short while, I got a word. They got a light tank across the river. They put on these platoons, I don't know how many platoons, and, and a small boat, they would push it across. And then we would go down, I would. I remember going down with Daly, trying to find that tank. He's gonna be with us. And the, the, uh, the, the Germans were surrendering like crazy at the right. I was down the, going down the Rhine to with this guy, a kid named Daly. I looked up in the in the, the vineyards, grapes, you know, all, all along the Rhine, and the Moselle, Moselle wine. 
with a, and I look, oh, I said, oh boy, there's a whole company coming out of the woods, out of the bank. And then I see they had a little white flag, so they surrender it. What do you guys do with all those prisoners? Ah, right. So they had them lined up, looking all over fishing. I said, well, keep going. Somebody will take care of you back there. <laughs> Also describe what did the Siegfried line look like? The, the Siegfried line was meant for a great defense. But what to my opinion what happened to the German before they got back to the Siegfried line, we, we they lost so many men they couldn't defend it like they had planned. You know, all bunkers, all along bunkers, millions and millions of tons of concrete they used. It, First uh, line of defense was this barbed wire, all shot by barbed wire. Then they had the dragon, dragon teeth where they could stop the tanks, you know. But you make one hole, a, hole in it, they didn't have enough people to defend the places that didn't have it, and we marched right through it. So they did, it simply didn't slow us up much. That's it? Huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, Good. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've done so wonderful. I'm just going to have you do one other 